delighted today to be talking with Dr. Rebecca Niv, who is a health psychologist. And Rebecca has worked with the Anaphylaxis campaign for many years, and in fact, was at one time one of our trustees and is still part of our clinical panel. Um, one of the subjects that comes up an awful lot, Rebecca, is the psychological impact of living with severe allergy. So I'd like to have a conversation with you today around that topic. Okay, great. So just start at the most basic question, really. Um, what in general is the psychological impact of being affected by a severe allergy? I think the main thing that people find when they have a food allergy or if they're looking after a child with food allergy is the, the fear that goes with that and the anxiety. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of fear around whether the child might have an allergic reaction and how severe that might be. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're a, a patient yourself, it's the fear around having a severe reaction and how you might treat that if you did and not really knowing what, what might happen. So there's a lot of fear and anxiety around that because food is something we can't avoid. So we can't avoid, we can't stop eating. Like if you were allergic to a cat or a dog, you, mm. could, you, you can see them, you know where they are, you can avoid them. You can't do that with food. And the things that we're allergic to in food hide. Mm. So it's really hard to, you know, to, to work out what it is you can and can't eat, what's safe and what's not and that you might have a reaction even if you are careful and that might come at any time so it's that unknown that mm. generates that fear it's the sort of the unexpected um it could happen at any time sort of thing so so you get a lot of a lot of fear and anxiety um and that obviously affects quality of life and it affects behavior so parents or children or adolescents who have food allergy um quite often find that it's stopping them doing things that they like to do that involve food. So a lot of the areas around quality of life that are affected are the areas where food is around. Um, so school trips or going on holiday, um, going out to eat at a restaurant, all the sorts of things that you um, tend to do as a family or you'd like to do, um, which improve your quality of life, you, tend, you might then start to avoid doing that. So we find in research and when we're talking to um, children and, and adolescents and parents and even adults as mm. well, that it's things around food that, that are the biggest thing that's, that's impacting their life. So they stop going to restaurants, they stop eating out because they see the risk as, as too great or they might not eat outside the family home or they might have to take their own food everywhere they go, pack lunches at school or their own food to a party, for example, or they might find that they're not being inv invited to parties because they're too difficult to cater for. And, and I think that's the same across all the different age groups. Right. So children um, rely very much on parents, obviously, to, to manage their allergy. Um, and probably don't really notice very much um, about how that might have an impact on their life um, unless they, they don't go to parties and they don't go on those school trips. Mm -hmm. um, but as they start to get older and take a bit more responsibility for their own sort of managing their own allergy, then they start to notice more about how much it might impact on their life. If they start to go out with their friends on their own, for example, and they're having to think about, oh, do I need to read food labels or do I just need to say, oh no, I'm not going to eat today because I'm not hungry, if they mm. want to tell their friends mm. about it. Um, but we find that adults are, who have food allergy tell us similar things. So adults mm. who have, have newly diagnosed food allergy, so they now can't eat something they used to be able to eat, say similar things. They, yeah. like, they get really frustrated that they can't eat the foods that they used to eat, they can't go out to restaurants without having to ask about what's in the food, um and so they find that the same sort of issues around quality of life and the things that they can't do um, which is really interesting and surprising that we find that adults are saying the very similar things to our parents and our adolescents as well mm. and of course what we're seeing at the anaphylaxis campaign are increasing number of 
uh, calls that we're getting through our helpline, through emails and on social media, which talk about more and more late onset. Mm. So um, yeah. it's very interesting to hear that the fundamental issues are the same across all of the different age ranges. Yeah. And what do you, what are the coping mechanisms that you advise? Well, I think coping is quite different across the ages. Yes. So whereas we see the similar areas of life being affected, we see that people, children, adolescents, adults and parents all might manage those things in different ways. Mm. So the children, uh, most of their coping strategies are around social support. So they use parents um, and the parents will um, maybe you know, carry the medication for them, carry the auto injectors for them, check the food labels for them. Um, but obviously, we try and get parents to involve the children as much as possible early on. I know you do mm. that. Yes. The advice yes. From the Blast campaign as well. That as soon as you feel your child's ready, that you try and involve them as much as possible in how, in managing their food allergy. Mm -hmm. So we've spoken to children who've said, "Oh yeah, I do, I do. I am starting to read my own food labels now, but I check with mum." Mm -hmm. So and it's usually mum. Yeah, it's sort of yes. interesting. It's usually mm -hmm. the mum who does a lot of the looking after, a lot of the, the cooking and the reading of the food labels, and they're checking that the child has a medication with them. So they'll say, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm starting to do that a bit more on my own." And, and so having that support from the parent is really helpful mm -hmm. um, because once they get to adolescence and they start going out and doing things on their own, we need to sort of equip them with the right strategies, <laughs> the mm -hmm. right coping strategies, because if they've never done it before and then they, they go out on their own for the first time, um, parents are really anxious because is my child going to be able to manage? Child might be anxious because they've never had to do this before on their own and they're now starting to take that responsibility and making the decisions themselves. So I think as children start to get older, they do take more responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, but we find that they that could swing two ways. Some children, I th and, and, and as they go into adolescence, try and minimise their allergy a lot. May not maybe talk to their friends about it. Um, they don't want to be seen as that person with allergy. They don't want to be different. Um, and so they might try uh, strategies like, you know, not talking about it, not telling their friends, um, trying to minimise the importance of it. Um, obviously, just to make sure that it doesn't really have an impact on their life and they're not treated differently by their friends. Um, but quite often that's not very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it means that they might not go out to eat with their friends because their friends don't know they have an allergy. So that has an impact on, on their quality of life and their ability to socialise. Or if they do have an accidental reaction, their friends don't know what's happening, so mm -hmm. they don't yes. know how to help. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the flip side of that, we have children who are very anxious, <laughs> yes. don't take any risks, um, always carry their injector with them, always read their food labels. Um, but that could spill into very hypervigilant behaviour, so yes. you're never eating it anything outside of the home and, and avoiding places that they think are too risky um, and that increases anxiety yes yes so the best um, strategies that we suggest are something where you've got a bit of a balance in the middle mm -hmm. where obviously you want to take care and, and assess the risk of um, having an accidental reaction in various situations making sure you've got your medication with you and make sure you've got your auto injector with you um, and if possible, you know, talk to your friends about it. We've spoken to children who don't have food allergy about their views. And they say, we'd like to know if my friend had a food allergy, I'd want to know about mm. it. And because I'd like to be able to help and we need to know more about this. Why don't they tell us more about it in schools? So the children without food allergy are telling us we want to help and we want to know and we want this education, which is great. Um, so I think if, if children and adolescents who do have a food allergy can share that with their friends, that helps mm, yes. enormously um, and reduces the anxiety of the child, but can also reduce anxiety of the parent as well. I think mm. parents can get really anxious if they think oh, my child's going out with their friends, their friends don't even know they have a food allergy. So you know those sorts of coping strategies we'd say would be um, really useful. So to use the support of your friends 
and use the support of your family um, to plan, to plan ahead. A lot of the teenagers we talk to use their phones to plan. So if they're going out with um, their friends and their friends say, should we go to this restaurant or should we go out, out and eat? They'll look on their phone to see, well, what, what's the menu? Is there anything there that I can eat? Does it look safe? Uh, and if not, they'll suggest to their friends, can we go somewhere else? Yes. You know, yeah. So that, that planning um, yes. can really help mean that they actually can then go out and eat with their friends. And yeah. They're not thinking, oh, I'll, I'll. you know, there, there are other planning strategies like, will you guys go out and eat? And I'll meet you afterwards. Mm, yes. You know, so if you are a little bit worried about eating out, particularly if you're out on your own with your friends and you don't really want to, then there are strategies. But but I think that your friends need to know what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because absolutely. if you say, "Well, I'm not coming out to eat," I'll meet you after. They might find, "Oh, well, why? What, what are they doing?" That it's for? all about the communication, it piece, is. isn't it? It and, really, really um, is. I think we would agree with you. That's just so important. Yeah. And um, that's why we've produced uh, free courses for families, mm -hmm. free courses for everyone who works in a school, so that it's not seen as a niche thing with certain people having yeah. knowledge about it. But basically everyone in the circle around mm -hmm. the individual has some level of understanding yeah. around how this individual has to behave in the yeah. context of food. I, yeah. I would absolutely agree with yeah. you. I think that's really really important and i think that that knowledge is key so having a good understanding of your food allergy and how you manage it is really important and children and, and adolescents tell us that quite often they feel as if they don't understand enough that mm. they haven't seen their clinician in, enough they would like to go back and see them more often to talk about their allergy and how they manage it and to have a greater understanding of of things like, well, what does an allergic reaction feel like? Yes. Uh, when yeah. do I need to use my auto injector? I don't really know if mm. I'm having an anaphylactic reaction or if I'm not. Or, you know, I'm having a reaction, but it's different to last time. Do I need my auto injector? Do I not need it? I'll just take some antihistamines and see if that works. And mm. so, not having that understanding of, of what to do and how to use your auto injector. I think is really key um, and some of the children we talk to so what they do is they go onto YouTube and they watch the YouTube videos of how you use your auto mm. injector and that helps them as well because just telling them how to use it is not as good as watching something and watching how it's used. Absolutely and the other issue is that you can show somebody you will know this as a psychologist you can show somebody something once or twice but actually they need to be told it and to have that repetitive training yeah. uh, that helps them in all, in the circumstances absolutely so what we we suggest um and recommend and i know the clinicians do as well and you do too is that people um to practice with with a trainer mm. or to inject it but do that regularly yes you know so yeah. we know that if people only practice once then they'll forget they, they quickly forget mm. and then you know something might happen and that they need to use it and they can't remember so practice pra practicing you know once a month or you know at least once every other month is really really important just to remind yourself how do i use that injector what do i do so when you need it in an emergency it's, it's again it's about that planning and preparation um, mm. and knowing what to do if there is an emergency so that your anxiety about that goes down yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fantastic that there are health psychologists like yourself who are now within the NHS and that parents and young people and adults can access those services. But you're rare. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. aren't many of you. No. I think I can count on one hand the number of health psychologists yeah. that are available within the NHS, yeah. um, which is a shame because we know how important the service that you provide is yeah. so bearing that in mind where would you suggest that people can get support because not everyone is going to be fortunate enough to have access to something like yourself yeah 
I think it's very difficult because, as you said, there aren't that that many psychologists. You know, there are, and they tend to be down south. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the psychology services or the, the the allergy clinics we know have that psychological yes. support are in London and in Southampton are the only two places we know of at the moment. Um, that might in increase, um, but actually getting the funding for that is, is really difficult. Yes. And I know that those services in, in London and Southampton are inundated with people. Well, people um, travel quite a distance, yes. don't they, to yeah. access they do. them? They do, um, which is a shame. Um, and we are campaigning to try and um, improve that situation so mm. that their um, allergy clinics feel better equipped to maybe put in their own business cases to get funding for um, some psychological services. But without that, I mean, there are a couple of avenues. I mean, there are lots of psychologists that you could see privately. Obviously, you would need to, mm. to pay, and obviously that's and not to check ideal. Them out. <laughs> and to check them out, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, to make sure that they, um, you know, they are properly qualified. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, it's it's the you know the, the charities and the support that places like the Anaphylaxis campaign offers, uh, and the, your websites are just absolutely amazing. And the amount of information on there is really important um, because you can't um, trust all the information that's on the internet, mm. um, and there are lots of um, sort of internet sites that you might find that provide you with information there's lots of online discussion boards as well mm. where you could go and chat to other uh, patients or other parents who are in that situation but you never know if the information you're getting is accurate and correct and I know that your all of your leaflets are and all of your information is information standard stamped so we know it's all accurate we know it's been peer-reviewed so I'd say you know anybody's first port of call should be website have a look at the information on there um, use the the helpline if that's needed as well um, if you need information for the schools you've got lots of information on there for schools as well um, and i guess the only other route through is to um, you know keep talking to your gp and keep talking to your clinicians and saying you want psychological support and psychological yes. services yes um, and you might be lucky enough to get referred to somebody who can help yeah yeah i mean we do have support groups which are made up of individuals yeah. and that they can they can help as well but i yeah. i absolutely agree with you i think to get that information that is properly clinically based because yeah. the online resources are brilliant but also there can be information out there which isn't yeah as it as it should be yeah yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, for it's speaking to us this afternoon. As I say, we are such strong advocates as an organisation of getting as many health psychologists as we can and helping clinics and individuals lobby for more services like yours, which fill a very, very important need. Thank, thank you. you very much, Lynn. Thanks.